Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Loretta Young, Robert Preston, and Edwin Arnold in The Lady from Cheyenne. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Whoever said it's a man's world must have had his tongue in his cheek when he said it, or a very red cheek after he said it. But however he said it, he was leading with his chin. It was dangerous to say that, even in the days of the wild and woolly West, as we'll prove tonight, in the play called The Lady from Cheyenne. The lady in the case is Loretta Young, and the gentlemen in her life are Robert Preston and Edward Arnold, who learned about women from her in Frank Lloyd's Universal Picture. Of course, there's always plenty of action in a story of the Wild West, because whether it was a woman's world or not, the men still thought it was their world. But the lady from Cheyenne beats the frontier politicians at their own game and reminds us, rather forcibly, that women were voting in Wyoming long before the rest of the country ever considered the idea. Wyoming deserves a deep bow from her 47 sisters for being the first to present the ladies with the ballot. But there are reasons other than voting why American women take more of a hand in public affairs today. For one thing, they have more time off from domestic affairs thanks to the gifts of modern science, like Lux Flakes, for instance. Women gave that a smashing vote long ago and immediately elected it to a prominent place on millions of kitchen shelves. It's been re-elected at every election since, and the record shows it's done an outstanding job for its constituents. Women judge by past performances, so Lux Flakes continues to get their ballots. Now I'd like you all to meet the lady from Cheyenne. The curtain goes up on Act One, Starring Loretta Young as Annie Morgan, Robert Preston as Stephen Lewis, and Edward Arnold as Jim Cork. <laughs> April 14th, 1869. Under the state line, a printed notice is being tacked to the rough boards of a brand new railroad station in Wyoming. It reads, Notice. The railroad wishes to announce a public auction of lots in the proposed township of Laraville. Sale begins at 10 a.m. It's almost 10 now, and the crowd is gathering. From miles around they come, by foot, by horse, by buckboard, and by the new steel monster of the prairie, the railroad train. These are the founding fathers of Laraville. Ranchers, farmers, merchants, gamblers, and inevitably, crooked land sharks. One of these is just stepping off the train now, Mr. James Cork. As he waves his big hand to the crowd, he's greeted by a loud cheer from his henchmen. Hello, Barney. Hello, Joe. How are you, boss? Uh, fine. You fellas ready to go? Sure. You won't have no trouble. Just settlers and speculators here. Anybody else be rolled out. Ah, uh, good work, Barney. Say, boys, I want you to meet Steve Lewis. Steve the boy. Howdy, Chance. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Now, uh, Steve here is going to run the auction. So that we'll know everything is going to be done my way. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, that's right. Nice and legal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Nice and legal. Now, look, boys, I want all the river lots. And Steve here is going to be taken with a sudden affliction. He won't be able to hear anybody bid unless they're standing down close. And that's where you boys ought to be, do you understand? Sure, boss. Good. Well, let's get started. And remember, $50 a lot is the top price we pay. All right. All right, everybody, down this way. The auction's down here. Come down this way, ladies and gentlemen. My good friends, fellow pioneers, and all you elegant ladies. <laughs> you've walked, you've rode, you've come by train. I know you've had a long, hard trip, but that's over with. We're going to hold this auction, and we're going to found a town. And we're going to build it up until New York and Chicago have something to shoot at. Yeah! Oh, wait a minute. I, I know, I know you're all anxious to get started, so I'll introduce you to Mr. Steve Lewis, my lawyer. He's going to run the auction. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lewis. Ah, all right, folks, you've all had a chance to study the map, so let's make it quick. 
Let's start with lot number 57. What do I hear? What am I bid? I bid 50. 60. 75. I bid $50. Do I hear more? I said 75. 50 it is then. Sold to this gentleman for $50. Just a minute, mister. I bid 75. Sale is closed on that lot. But I bid $75. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. You hear me all right, and it ain't legal. Now, I, hold I, on, I... my friend. At this minute, you're breaking the law, attempting to intimidate a legal representative of the railroad. What? By threats both implied and spoken. And according to the verdict handed down in the case of State versus Peckham, you're in grave danger of standing liable for a term of not less than four, nor more than six years in prison. Prison? Who's in prison? Peckham language there for five years. Well, I, uh, I don't want no trouble with the law. <laughs> nice work, Steve. Yeah, nice and legal. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now, lot number 72, River Lot. What am I bid for this lot? $75. $50. $50. Do I hear more? I bid 75 Sold for $50. Oh, and yeah. now for lot number 38. A beautiful garden spot on the river. What am I bid? What do I hear? $50. $50 I'm bid. Do I hear more? One moment, please. One moment. I bid $75. Say, women can't bid here. Which one was it, Steve? Hey, here she comes. The girl in the funny hat. Excuse me, please. Let me through. I bid 75 so what's she supposed to be dressed up for? This is an auction, not a masquerade. Oh, now, be generous, Jim. The young lady's costume is a mere 20 years behind the time. $75? Let me through, please. Hey, lady, where did you find that hat? <laughs> that fellow looks like my old rooster after he got sick. <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. I bid $75 for that lot. Now, just a minute, ma'am. Uh, will you hold my umbrella, please? What? Thank you very much. And now I do hope you're all going to be gentlemen and not bid any more. What? Because I want that particular lot. Well, ma'am, just who are you bidding for? I'm not bidding for anybody except myself. Then what do you want the land for? Well, since you're nice enough to ask me, I'll tell you. I'm buying for speculation. I come from Philadelphia. My folks are Quakers. They're both dead, though. My mother died of heart trouble, arteriosclerosis. It's rather difficult to pronounce, but it's really a dreadful disease. My father's heart was quite good, but after my mother died, he was never quite the same. He finally came down with sugar in the blood. Did you ever have that? No, and no, I guess you wouldn't. You look quite strong. Well, anyway, my parents left me some money. And there I was, an orphan, with nothing to do but teach school forever in Philadelphia. And then my uncle told me about this place, and so here I am. And I have all the money my parents left me right here in this bag. It's $500. Except $34.60. That's what the trip cost so far. And if I have to, I'll bid all my money on that lot. So I do hope you're all going to be gentlemen and not bid any more. Say, is this real? There appear to be a number of children around here. Yes. Yes, I might even put up a schoolhouse. After all, if the town is going to be all you said, they'll probably need some learning, don't you think? I'll go on. Yes. Why, certainly no one would compete with you, miss, would they, Jim? Well, I... I Told to the young lady. What's your name, ma'am? My name is Annie Morgan. Thank you. Step over the table, make your payment, and get your deed. Oh, thank you very much. My umbrella, please. Thank you. Good day, gentlemen. Excuse me. Say, Steve, Excuse that was the best lot we had. What's this, anyway? Gallantry, Jim. Gallantry. Oh. two months, and we've just got the results of our first election. I'm happy to state that our whole ticket was elected unanimously. Yeah. That's up to the bar, gentlemen. The drinks are on me. <laughs> well, Steve, it's going great. My own mayor, my own sheriff, and my own judge on the bench. <laughs> and all legal, too. You know, Steve, I like this uh, thing being legal, you know? Saves a lot of trouble. <laughs> Great idea you got there. Just don't be too crude, Jim, or they're liable to believe the whole Civil War was just a frame-up. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, now we've got a government. Let's get busy on these water rights. Oh, then you got the school ma'am's property. No, she didn't sell, but don't worry. I'll roust her out of there fast enough. Oh, now listen, Jim. I've given the technique of being a robber baron a lot of study, and the main idea is to gang up on posterity, but to treat your contemporaries easily and legally. What do you mean by that? No rousting out. Get a bill of sale from her, then you'll have control nice and legal. All right. You sold it to her, now you get it back. Me get it. Yeah, and make it nice and legal. No, but Jim... Now, you hear me, Steve. Get down to that schoolhouse tomorrow and talk her out of it. If anyone can do it, you're the man. Do you know who Henry VIII was, children? No, ma'am. Well, he was the king of England. He had six... Well, anyway, he died in 1547 at the age of 56. And now we come to Joan of Arc. Hello. 
Why, Mr. Lewis? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Morgan. I really didn't mean to interrupt. I, I thought your class would be over. Oh, my goodness, and so it should be. It's after 3 o'clock. Very well, children. School is dismissed. Good night, Miss Morgan. Good night, Charlie. Come on, Nosey. I'll wait you for And be on time tomorrow now. I hope you'll forgive this intrusion. No intrusion, Mr. Lewis. I'll just straighten up my desk a little and... Oh. Oh, my goodness, my flowers. Oh, here, let me help you. Oh, dear. Oh, your dress is soaking. Oh, don't bother. It will dry in the sun. I got much wetter than this yesterday, holding Mrs. Lancey's baby. Oh. <laughs> well, look, I, uh... I thought perhaps you'd like to have this volume of Browning's poems. Oh, that's nice of you. The years at spring, the days at the morn. Morning at seven and hillside dew pearls. I beg your pardon? That's in Pippa Passes. Oh, yes, in Pippa Passes. By Browning. Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> I think of one of Mr. Browning's best, don't you? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. It was so thoughtful of you. No, don't mention it. Uh... Are you walking home? I always do. Well, may I walk with you? That's very nice of you indeed. I'd like to walk home with you. In high school in Philadelphia, when all the girls had boys to walk home with them, I used to wish... Well, what I mean is... There was one boy who would have walked home with me if he'd only stopped to think about it. What? Would you close the door, please? Thank you. <laughs> I live down this way at Mrs. McGinnis's. It's awfully nice of you. Oh, not at all, not at all. <clears throat> what was that? What? You said something. Oh, uh -huh. no. I thought you did. No? <clears throat> Rats that fought the dogs and killed the cats and ate the cheeses right out of the vat. What? Mr. Browning, the Pied Piper. Oh, <laughs> yes. Mr. Browning. Yes. Annie. Oh. Well, may I call you Annie? Well, yes, if you like. Annie, there's going to be a square dance tomorrow night. I know that. Well, are you, uh... Well, do you dance? Well, I hadn't before. But I'm sure I could learn very quickly. Oh, I see. And I think it's very nice of you to ask me, Mr. Lewis. I don't know why you should want me to go with you, but I'm glad that you do. Square dancing and moonlight. Doesn't it sound romantic? Yes, it certainly does. And there's sure to be a moon. And if you don't mind, there's something I'd like to try out. They talk about it in all the books. But I don't want to embarrass you. Well, I'm sure you won't. What is it? Well... In all the books that I've read, just as the last waltz is being played, there's always sort of a pause. Well, it's really more of a throb-like, and... Well, it's then I'd like you to kiss me. Oh, but... Well, I... Oh, now, you needn't be worried that I'll take it personally. Not, not that I mean to be impolite or anything like that, but... Well, what I really mean is, you can feel absolutely safe with me. Oh. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> What is it? Oh, Mrs. What McGinnis, happened? it's wonderful. The square dance, I'm going to it. He asked me, Mr. Lewis, do you know how to dance? Dance? Yes. Why, my dear, that's how I won my present husband. Oh. Practically swept him off his feet. Well, then you can teach me how. I bought 15 yards of pink muslin with the sweetest little green flower you've ever seen. Pink and green, Annie? Yes, isn't it a lovely combination? Well, I don't know. And I bought 15 yards. Is that enough? I thought I'd get a lot in case we spoiled some. And a bustle, just like the one on your black dress. Can I have a bustle, Mrs. McGinnis? Let me see. Mm, yes, I think you could stand above. Oh, Mrs. McGinnis. Hello, Steve. How's everything going with the school, man? Oh, fine. Give me a beer. She learned dancing this afternoon, and now tonight I'm clumsy. Uh, uh, from here, you're a panic. <laughs> I can't carry on a conversation. I'm dull. Do you get that? I'm the one that's dull. <laughs> uh, take it easy. Just hold yourself together for the night and we're all set. Hey, listen, I've got an idea. Why? Let's give her the town and you and I move on with the railroad. <laughs> give me a beer, please. Oh, hello, Hank. I've been waiting to talk to you. Evening, Jim. Uh, Steve, you know Hank Freeman, editor-in-chief of the Laravel Weekly Bugle? Hi. Yes, I've had the pleasure. Well, excuse me, gentlemen. I've got to sit out the next one with Miss Morgan. Well, good luck, Steve. Well, Hank, I've been reading your paper. That's so? Yeah. I take it you don't like the way things are being run around here. Uh-huh. Just beginning to penetrate, huh? And I almost got the opinion that we don't need a newspaper or an editor either around here. Now, keep that in your button the next time you think of writing about me as a tyrant. Ah, oh, Jim, you've got the wrong idea. When I say tyrant, I mean a big man. Caesar, Nero, Napoleon. Oh. 
Oh, yeah? Why, I'm in favor of tyrants. Oh. Of course, there are all kinds of tyrants, but you're my favorite kind. You know, the benevolent type. Benevolence tempered with the fear of assassination. Good night, Jim. Just think it over. Do you, uh... Would you rather dance? Oh, it's lovely out here. Look at all those wonderful stars. Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might have the wish I wish tonight. A stove. What? A stove. I just wish for a brand new stove for my schoolhouse. Oh. <laughs> They're intoxicating, aren't they? The stars, I mean, and the moon. Do you think it sticks out too far in the back, or I mean I ought to have two of them? Two what? Two stoves for my schoolhouse. Oh, no, 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 just one. Oh. Isn't the dance wonderful? Now, look at this, Bustle. Do you think it sticks out too far? No. Mrs. McGinnis helped me make this dress. Do you like it? Yes. Yes, I do. Oh, thank you. Annie. Yes? You hear what they're playing? Yes. It's the last waltz. Do you remember what you asked me to do? Are you going to do it now? Yes. But, well, there's one thing I'd like to know. Oh, certainly, Stephen. Well, I'd like to know if... Well, have you ever been kissed before? No. Does that make any difference? Well, it may come as more of a surprise than you think. Oh, but I'm not taking it personally. Oh, all right. Come close to me. Like this? Yes. Oh. Well? Oh, there's something just rushing around inside of me. I... I feel like giving presents to everyone. Oh, that's very good, Edward. Now put all the history books together. And here's Shakespeare. Ah, this bud of love by summer's ripening breath. May prove a beauteous flower when next we meet. Mush. That's Romeo and Juliet, Edward. It's still mush. Well, it will seem romantic to you someday. You'll see. Hello. Why, hello, Mr. Freeman. How are you? You can go home now, Edward. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Sit down, Henry. Annie, what's this I hear about you selling your property? Oh, yes, isn't it wonderful? Mr. Cork has given me three times the value. And he's giving me another lot of way up on the hill. Uh-huh. Our kind-hearted Mr. Cork. Yes. And as Stephen pointed out, after all, I did buy this land of speculation. You oh, know. Steve pointed it out. Yes. Annie, did you sign anything yet? Oh, no. I'm going to Mr. Cork's office this afternoon. Well, before you do, I'd like you to see this. It's a little notice that's been put up all around town since last night. To whom it may concern. Notice is hereby given that all water rights to the Laraville River are the property of James Cork Land Company. Permission to use water for irrigation or cattle must be purchased from the company. Well, what does it mean, Henry? It's a notice to the farmers. Now, uh -huh. if you sell your property to Jim Cork, he'll control the water of this county. The farmers won't be able to get a drop unless they pay him for it. So that's why he wanted my property. Uh-huh. And that's why Stephen came and gave me the book and... And even when he kissed me, he was thinking... Oh, I... oh I'm sorry, Annie. That's all right, Henry. I guess I've been kind of childish and silly, haven't I? Well, I think I've grown up. Just in this one minute. Good afternoon, Annie. Come right in. Well, Miss Morgan, we're certainly glad to see you. Are you Mr. Cork? Here, sit right there, Annie. Thank you. Uh, you've driven rather a hard bargain, Miss Morgan, and I don't know just where I'm going to come out on this proposition. Uh, but then I love the school kiddies, and they'll be much happier on top of the hill. After all, that's more important, isn't it? Is it, Mr. Cork? <laughs> now, here's the deed, Annie. And here's the pen you signed right there. Right there? Yes, right there. Well, go ahead. Is there anything wrong, Annie? Annie, Mr. Cork is a rather busy man. Yes, I know he is. Say, will somebody please tell me what's going on around here? Yes, Mr. Cork, I'll tell you. Some people don't think it's very, going, very nice to go around pretending friendship for business reasons. And kissing people. When they find out they've been fooled, they feel bad. 
really bad. They might even feel like breaking things. They might even feel like taking up the space and smashing it. And as for you, Mr. Cork, let me tell you something. As long as I have that property, any farmer who wants to can draw all the water he needs from that river. Why, you can't talk to me like that. You'll do as I say. You're making me mad, Mr. Cork. Awfully mad. Annie, put down that glass. I'll never in the world sign your papers. And if you try any more monkey business with me, I'll take you to law. Take me to law? Why, you filly, I'll... Stand back, Mr. Cork. I'll run you out of this town. Stand back or I'll smash you with my umbrella. You smash nobody. There. Oh. When I say a thing, I usually mean it. Good day, Mr. Cork. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of The Lady from Cheyenne with Loretta Young, Robert Preston, and Edward Arnold. Now we bring you our old friends, the Browning family. 17-year-old Dot Browning has a friend, Jean Saunders, spending the night with her. The two girls have just come home from a dance. And the polo, my pretty little poppy. Da, 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 da. Oh, Jean, wasn't the party divine? Mm, so, so. Why, Jean, I thought it was loads of fun. Well, for you, maybe. But I got stuck with that awful Briggs boy. Oh, well, those things do happen sometimes. They happen all the time with me. I loathe parties and boys and everything. Oh, honey, don't say that. You're just tired. Come on, let's get ready for bed. Oh, I'm practically there now. What on earth are you going to do? Lots my undies. My goodness, it's a tie of the night. Of course. It only takes a moment, and undies have to be luxed every day. Oh, but why? Why, Jean, for daintiness, of course. Oh, my... Dot, I never thought about that. Oh, now, don't look so sunk, honey. Come along and see how easy it is to be dainty nowadays. See how fast you get fed with new quick luck? You don't have to wait for hot water, either. Mm-hmm. And then you just squeeze your undies through the suds and that fresh as a daisy. Dot Browning has done a very helpful thing for her friend, Jean. Because after this, Jean is always going to be dainty. And that quality always makes a girl seem lovely and lovable. As Dot says, it's easy now with new quick lux to protect daintiness and avoid offending. These sheer flakes dissolve in a flash and take away perspiration quickly, yet gently. Lux is thrifty, too, because a little goes so far. So keep that generous big box handy all the time. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Lady from Cheyenne, starring Loretta Young as Annie Morgan, Robert Preston as Stephen Lewis, and Edward Arnold as Jim Cork. With Jim Cork in the driver's seat, the government of Laraville became a reign of terror. Objectors to his rule were shot or beaten. Their homes set afire. And one night... Annie Morgan watched her schoolhouse burn to the ground. Hank Freeman, the fighting newspaper editor, is the only one who dares to tell the truth about the tyrant, Jim Cork. Read all about it. Schoolhouse burns. Read all about Jim Cork. Arsonist. Read all. Oh. Henry. Henry, are you all right? Take some water. Oh, oh you poor thing. What have they done to you, Henry? Oh, it's just my arm. Oh. It'll be all right. This is the last straw. We're going to do something to stop this. We certainly are. <laughs> and the purpose of this meeting is to prove that we, the better citizens of Laraville, are willing to face our responsibilities. We've had enough of Jim Cork. And we're here to see that in some way he's put in jail. Well, that's all very well, but, but who's going to put him there? Why, whoever puts people in jail. That's unimportant. The fact is, they shot our editor and they have burned down my schoolhouse. Sure, and... sure, but you've got to convict him and that takes a jury. Then we'll have a jury. That's a simple matter. Why, of course it is. The chair hereby calls for volunteers. Who'd like to be on the jury? Raise your hands, please. Well, what's the matter with you? Gentlemen, it can't be that you're afraid. Why, there must be 12 men in this town who aren't afraid. Well, there evidently aren't. Oh, if we only had a women's jury, we'd soon fix Jim Cork. Mrs. McGinnis? That's just what we need. We'll have a women's jury. 
That ought to be very simple, too. None of this men's business about being open-minded and not prejudiced, as they say. We want a good prejudiced jury. <laughs> Annie, look, it's Jim Court. Uh, come right in, boys, come right in. Put the refreshments on the table there. Good afternoon, ladies. What is the meaning of this intrusion? Well, we heard you were going to have a meeting, so I thought you might like to have some refreshments. At the same time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Stephen Lewis, our candidate for the legislature, a fellow all your husbands are going to vote for. We want no part of you or your candidate. Ladies, ladies, restrained, if you please. We don't want to start any trouble. We want to do it by law. Mr. Cook, a jury is going to convict you, and it will be a women's jury. A women's jury? Yes. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that's good, that is. Go on, tell us, Steve. Tell him what's wrong with it, will you? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, what is wrong with it, Mr. Lewis? Well, I'm very much afraid that ladies can't possibly sit on a jury. Why not? Well, because under the law, only those who have the franchise can serve as jurors. Franchise? Yes. Yeah. That means the right to vote. And anyone incapable of voting at an election is also ipso facto barred from acting on a jury. Is that so? Yes, it is, ma'am. And I suggest that if you intend going into public life, you start by reading Blackstone. Oh, it's Blackstone now, is it? It isn't Mr. Browning anymore. Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Lewis. Blackstone or no Blackstone, we'll have women on that jury and they'll convict Jim Cook. I promise you. Yeah! In other words, Henry, he said we couldn't do it. But we can, can't we? No, Steve was right. You see, there's law, Annie. Laws that man made. And under them, a woman is just a chattel. Chattel? A piece of property without any rights at all. Well, that's a nice thing. Oh, their laws that you live and breathe, and I guess they think you should be thankful for that much. Well, I'm not at all thankful, Henry. There's something just boiling up inside of me. I think I'm just plain mad. I'd like to hit somebody. Sure, sure, but organizations have to be started. And before things can be changed, bills have to be passed up there in Cheyenne, in the legislature. It takes time. Listen, hear that crowd? Yes. Uh, the election must be over. Hank! Oh, Hank! Well, John? Oh, it's all over, Hank. Steve Lewis was just elected to the legislature. Oh. That settles it. I'm going to take the next train to Cheyenne. I'll get a bill passed, so that's what has to be done. Goodbye, Henry. I'll be back on Thursday. <laughs> Do you mind my sitting here? Why should I? It's a public conveyance. You may sit any place you please. Thank you, Annie. Annie, why don't you be a sweet little girl and go back to the school kids and books and friends and, and leave these things to people who know what they're all about? Mr. Lewis, will you please not annoy me anymore? I'm reading. To the beauteous evening, calm and free. Oh, Mr. Browning. Mr. Wordsworth. Oh. It is a beauteous evening, calm and free. The holy time... Annie, at least let me give you one piece of advice. If you insist upon going to the legislature, you should do everything you can to make a good impression. You should try to be as pretty as possible. What? And Annie, if you don't mind my saying so, you really ought to get a new hat. Will you please let me read? No, Annie, I only And leave want... me alone. Just go away from me, do you hear? Go away. Hey, what's the matter here? Is he bothering you, Matt? Bothering me. He is the most bothersome man who ever lived. Why, Annie? Oh, one of them, huh? Well, I'll fix him. Why, are you... <laughs> hey, let me in on this. Who started it out, Murray? Uh, get fresh, huh? Well... The gentleness of heaven rules all the sea. It's a beauteous evening. Calm and free. room as you'll find in Cheyenne. There's a lump in the mattress, but you can curl around it. And we've got one strict rule. No singing after two o'clock in the morning. Come in. Hello, dearie. I'm Elsie, and this is Myrtle and Gertie. Well, how do you Hello, do? There. How do you do? I'm Annie Morgan. You're new here, aren't you, honey? Yes, I am. I'm going to be here for only a few days. I have to hurry right back to Laraville. You don't say. Yes. Looks like you got out in kind of a hurry, too. Oh, I did. The ladies felt I should lose no time. They all came down to put me on the train. They oh, put you on the train. No. Oh. Well, the same thing happened to me once. Say, maybe we could get you in the show over at the palace. We're dancing over there. Yeah. Dancing is wonderful, isn't it? Except that men get awfully tired. Yeah. Men ain't what they used to be. 
Come on over to my room, Derry. Let's have a drink and get acquainted. Oh, that's nice of you, Elsie. Thank you very much, but I don't drink. Honest? No. <laughs> well, come on, girls. See you later, Derry. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, can you tell me how to get to the legislature? Oh, sure. They're in session right now. Just down two blocks, and then turn to your right, and you can't miss it. Fairchild has the floor. Mr. Speaker and gentlemen, I make a motion that we don't allow smoking while this assembly is in session. Are you crazy? Quiet! Quiet! Gentlemen, gentlemen, you don't understand. The first thing we want to do is to make a good impression on the taxpayers. Now, this no smoking resolution will look mighty good on the books. Well, that's different. All those in favor of the no-smoking resolution say aye. Aye. The motion has been passed unanimously. Your Honor, uh, Mr. Speaker. Quiet in the visitor's gallery. But I have a bill I want passed. Quiet. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to positively refuse to come back here unless I have some comfort. We ought to have swivel chairs and desks. Very sound idea. Very sound. Now, wait a minute. How do you think that's going to look on the books? Huh? I suppose you all know you're talking a lot of nonsense. What's that? I've never heard you in a silly talk in all my life. And it's ridiculous. I should like to call the attention of the speaker to the fact that visitors are not allowed to interrupt the proceedings of the house. I am not a visitor. I am more a part of this assembly than death star. I have something important. Mr. Speaker, and... no resolution has yet been passed approving the presence of women in the visitor section. And I move that until such resolution is passed, that the young lady retire to the hall. I second the motion. Will you please stop making motions while I'm talking? Go ahead. You all heard the motion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Young woman, will you please retire to the hall and no back talk. You've been waiting a mighty long time, ma'am. Is there something I could get for you? No, thank you. Talk, talk, talk. Don't they ever do anything but talk in there? Well, ma'am, I've been taking care of the gentleman's hats a number of years, and I ain't heard much but talk. Of course, sometimes they lay cornerstone for exercise. Hmm. Well, I haven't any time to waste around here. I have to get my bill passed and be back home by Thursday. Mighty fast work, ma'am. You must be in a powerful hurry. Oh, I am. I have to be back and put a man in jail. That's so. There's a join. Excuse me, ma'am. I gotta get the gentleman's hats. Well, hello, Annie. You'll be happy to know that we get our desks in two weeks. Good day. Good day. Oh, Your Honor. Huh? Your Honor, I have a bill I want introduced. What district, ma'am? Laraville district. Oh, uh, you'll have to speak to Mr. Stephen Lewis. He introduces all the Laraville bills. But good day, ma'am. Oh. Oh, sir. Will you help me? At your service, miss. What is it? I have a bill I want introduced. Well, miss, what sort of a bill is it? Well, it's a bill that will give women the franchise. That means it will give women the right to vote. Women's suffrage. So that's what you want, is it? That scatterbrained idea of women voting. Why, you women don't know how to think. If you had two ideas, your heads would split open. Well, now, wait a minute. Let I... me tell you something. Woman's places in the home with babies. Don and a good man socks and doing the wash. But, sir, you And if be... you were someone that belonged to me, I'd give you a darn good spank. Good day. Gentlemen in the parlor to see Annie. Thank you. Oh. It's you. Annie, come in here a minute, please. I don't think I have... Please. Well? Annie, I want to be friends with you. Are you going to help me? Well, I'd like to help you, but not your bill. Annie, as a friend of yours, it hurts me to see you wearing yourself out, making... Well, I'm going to have to say it, Annie. Making a ridiculous figure of yourself. Why, how dare now, you Now, wait, wait, here. wait. Annie... I told you on the train you're a sweet, silly child. Why, instead of worrying about other people, you should have someone to take care of you. You should be married and have a good man to look after you. Why, you aren't meant to be an old maid, Annie. There's too much woman in you, real honest woman. Yeah. And you'd be pretty, too. Darn pretty if you'd fix yourself up, do something with your hair, make it sort of fancy, and wear some attractive clothes. Why, you could do a lot with yourself if you'd take the trouble. You think so? Why, sure. And I'll bet back in Laraville there's a dozen good men that would marry you. Oh, you do, do you? Well, you just get right out of here and take your advice with you. And please don't tell me what I should wear and how I should look, and don't ever speak to me again. Annie! Go away, go away, I hate you! <laughs> Well, 
Well, dearie, I hope you didn't let him see you cry. I'm not crying. No, of course you're not. I'm just mad. I'm just real mad. You must be pretty stuck on him to get that mad. I hate him. He's done everything he could to stop me ever since I first came here. And he said I don't have to be an old maid, even though I don't wear my hair the way he likes it. He wants it fancy. I never hated anyone so much in all my life. Not even the man in Philadelphia who beat his dog. Oh, now, wait a minute, kid. Take it easy. Tell me all about it, and I may be able to patch things up. I don't want things all patched up. I want them all ripped apart. Oh, Elsie. I've just got to get that bill introduced now so as I can show him. I, I've got to find some way. If I just knew somebody in there. You mean someone in the legislature? Uh-huh. Well, if that's all you need, your troubles are over. Elsie, you mean you know one of them? One of them? I know them all. When do you want your bill introduced, dearie? Oh, Elsie. The matter of the bill for women's suffrage. I move that it be tabled and referred to the Judiciary Committee. I second the motion. Those in favor? Aye. The bill for women's suffrage is hereby tabled. What happened, ma'am? Anything? Nothing, George, nothing. My bill was introduced and they wouldn't even vote on it. They referred it to, to that committee. Oh, that's bad. Well, what will happen to it, George? Well, they'll just kick it around and, and report it out on the floor without comment. Oh. When a bill comes out without comment, it's dead, buried, and forgotten. That's what used to happen down there in Washington. Oh, dear. Then we'll have to get some comment. Yes, miss. It appears to me we's going to need a whole mess of comments. Yes. Well, what did they do in Washington when this happened? Well, they always got to the highest man. The speaker? Well, no, ma'am, the very highest man with the biggest influence. Yes. Uh, this case would call for the governor. The governor, of course. Why didn't I think of it? Well, I'll see him right away, George. Uh, miss, if you do it the way the politicians do... Yes? Well, it's like a stalking possum. A slip up on him kind of easy like then... Wham! Wham? Uh, yes, sir. The governor's giving a ball tonight. Oh, then I'll see him there. Of course, you got to have engraved invitation, else the butler won't let you in. Uh, I seen some in the gentleman's pockets in the cloakroom, but would you like one, miss? George, if anyone had told me two weeks ago that I'd accept stolen goods, but... Thank you, George. Yes, sir. I was going to be there too tonight, miss. They hired me as a waiter. And begging your pardon, ma'am, the ball's going to be mighty, mighty fancy. The ladies is going to be dressed in a mess of elegant... Uh, you know, the proper kind of wham. Now, don't you worry, George. I'll get a dress. And one with a great deal of the proper kind of wham. Now, just stand still, Annie. Ah, oh, it looks fine. Does it? I... I feel sort of naked. Hey, what's she doing in my dress? Get out of that. Keep quiet, Gertie. She needs it. What for? Is she joining the show? No, I'm not, Gertrude. I'm going to the governor's ball. The what? Uh-huh. And I needed a dress. It's very important. Oh, well, why? Annie's doing a job for all of us. She's going to get us votes. Votes? For what? Votes for whatever we want to vote for. Annie says we're all chattels. Well, of all the nerve. What's that? Slaves of men. And when we get the vote, we'll be just as good as men. That's why Annie's going to the ball. No, that's crazy. Oh, no. Wait a minute, Elsie. I'm, I'm getting nervous. I don't think I can do it. Oh, sure you can, No, kid. I really don't. I... What you need is some nerve medicine. Huh? I hate to give it away, but it sure looks to me like you need it. Here, take a slug. Well, what kind of medicine is it, Elsie? Just general strengthening. Elegant for the nerve. Oh. I call it Pepso. Uh-huh. A gentleman gave it to me. Well, how much do I take? Oh, as much as you can hold. Oh. You see, it kills the germs inside your nerves. Oh. Now, down with it, dearie. <laughs> at a girl, at a oh, girl. There, there, dearie, that's all right. Oh, it's awful. I know what it is. That's because it's good medicine. Oh. Here, drink some more. Oh, I can't. It burns too much. Well, that's part of the treatment. <laughs> you know, I stand a lot of it burning just so I can oh. keep my health. Annie. Where's Annie Morgan? Did you see her? Meet the new addition. Well, fuzzle my bustle, dearie. I'd never know you. You well, don't look like the same girl. Oh. Here, look what's come for you. Telegram. Telegram for me? Oh, shaking. Here, oh. let me do it. Clark shot dead this morning. Oh, I knew it was something horrible. 
Clark taking water from your land, only place he could get it, killed by Cork's men. We have the evidence if you have the vote. Hank Freeman. John Clark shot dead. Friend of yours, honey? Shot. Just for taking water for his children, maybe. Oh, that wicked man. That awful Jim Cook. Now I've got to go to that ball, Elsie. I've just got to. That's all there is to it. You want some of this medicine? Elsie? I think I do. Bottoms up, dearie. Mm. Now take it easy. That's the way that's a girl. <sighs> Annie, are you all right? Are you all right, Annie? Bring on the governor. That a girl, Annie. <laughs> Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mr. DeMille and our stars Loretta Young, Robert Preston, and Edward Arnold will return in just a moment for Act Three of The Lady from Cheyenne. And now for a little demonstration of one striking fact about our product. Listen to these two girls, each typing a letter. You have just heard the difference between two girl typists. One very slow, the other three times as fast. Now, if you were a business manager and these two girls applied for a job, which would you pick? What do you say, Sally? <laughs> the fast one, of course. She'd have a day's work finished while the first one was just getting started. And if you were a busy home manager with a lot of soaps at your grocers applying to you for jobs, which would you choose? A slow one or one that was three times as fast? Why, the fast one, of course. And that's why New Quick Lux wins out. Because it's so much faster. By actual test, in water as cool as your hand, it dissolves three times as fast, not just twice, three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps. That's big help, Mr. Ruick. It takes no time at all to do stockings and undies every night with new Quick Lux. It's a wonderful time saver. Another thing you've probably noticed is how little you need to get rich, abundant suds. New Quick Lux flakes are thrifty. Last but not least, you can always depend on Lux Purity. It's the gentlest kind of soap that can be made. Safe for anything, safe in water alone. Yes, there are three very good reasons why American women have chosen new quick Lux for their pretty washables by a vote of two to one. Why twice as many women use it for their nice things as use any other flakes, chips, or beads. It's fast, it's thrifty, it's safe. Don't forget to keep that generous big box handy all the time. New Quick Lux comes in the same familiar package at no extra cost. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of The Lady from Cheyenne. <laughs> Annie has gone to the governor's ball, filled with a noble sense of duty and half a bottle of Elsie's nerve tonic. In her new clothes, beautiful and radiant, she dances with her unsuspecting victim, the governor himself. Oh, governor, I hesitate to say it, but you're so different from what I imagined. Really? Oh, yes. Your beard. Your beard is beautiful. You must have brushed it a great deal, governor. Well, yes, but And I... you're not old at all. Why, thank you, my dear. <laughs> it's warm in here, isn't it? Governor, could we go someplace where it's cool? Why, yes. Would you like to step out on the terrace? Oh, thank you. Bye. It's lovely out here, isn't it? I'm awfully glad to be alone with you. Oh, that's very nice of you. Yes, isn't it? But then you see, I have my reasons. That's why I came here tonight. I do hope you're not going to be angry with me, too. Angry? Yes. You see, I, I really want you to help me with my bill. Oh. And the bill is to give women a franchise. That means they can vote. Women's suffrage. Yes. Yeah. Now, just pretend for a minute that you're Mr. Lincoln and you're freeing the slaves. Why, Governor, 
You'd even look like him if your beautiful beard were dark. Oh, would I? Uh-huh. Really? Oh, yes, indeed. And now you will help me, won't you? Well, I'm afraid there's nothing I can do. Oh. You'll have to do some lobbying. Lobbying? Oh, yes, yes. Well... My dear, I'm afraid I'll have to join my other guests. Oh. Shall we go inside? Well, thank you, Governor, but if you don't mind, I think I'll just stay right out here and think over all you've said. Why, well, of course, of course. Yes. May I have another dance later? Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you. Evening, ma'am. Oh, hello, George. Are you doing fine, no, Miss Missy? No, I'm not. I'm not getting anywhere. He told me to go in that lobby again, and, oh, George, I sat in that lobby so much. No, ma'am. He means two lobbies. That's the way they get everything did in Washington. Oh, how do they do it? Well, it's this way. Uh -huh. Lobbying is making use of the fact that the Republicans hate the Democrats, uh -huh. and the Democrats hate the Republicans. Uh -huh. So they's already suspicious of each other. You just got to help them along. Help them along? Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Fairchild, he's the leader of the Republicans, and Mr. Dunbar, he's the Democrat boss. Uh -huh. You ought to see both of them. Thank you, George. I will. <laughs> Miss Morgan, ma'am, you're very, very flattering. Oh, not at all, Mr. Fairchild. <laughs> oh, Mr. Fairchild, the governor told me the funniest story about the Democrats. That's so, ma'am. <laughs> you are a Republican, aren't you? Born and bred, ma'am. Well, the governor said that all the Republicans are so smart... They're much smarter than the Democrats. Is that so, ma'am? Oh, yes. He said that the Republicans are all going to vote for the bill tomorrow. Eh? Yeah? Uh -huh. well, what bill is that? The woman's suffrage bill. Well, I didn't think anyone wanted that bill to go through. Oh, of course they don't. They'll turn it down. But it will look so good on the record for the Republicans to vote for it. You see, they'll get the credit for being liberal, and they still won't lose anything because they'll be letting the Democrats vote it down. Yeah, I see. <laughs> well, that's a right smart idea. Yeah. Miss Morgan, every Republican in the legislature will vote for that bill tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Fairchild, aren't you the smartest <laughs> man? I just love your beard. Do you brush it off? Why, yes, Miss Morgan, but... Oh, it's lovely. You know, Mr. Dunbar, I have so much respect for the Democrats. And you are a Democrat, aren't you? A uh, fighting one, ma'am. I knew you would be. And I wanted to tell you how right you were to scold me for that suffrage. Bill. Oh, no, ma'am. Oh, yes, indeed. The governor himself convinced me how ridiculous it was. But he hopes the Democrats will vote for it. Vote for it? Oh, yes. Don't you see? Don't you see? Well, He's uh, going to make the Republicans vote again? Well, I... Oh, I see, ma'am. I yes. knew you Of would. course. Let the Republicans vote against yes. it. I'll have every Democrat in the legislature vote for it. Oh, Mr. Dunbar, you're the smartest man. Of course, you know, Miss Morgan, you're making quite a spectacle of yourself. All the other gentlemen seem to like it, Mr. Uh, Lewis. You're quite the belle of the ball. So I've been told all evening. I want to talk to you. Come along. Where? Out here, out on the terrace. Oh, I don't know, Mr. Lewis. I, I went for a walk with you at one dance, and... Oh, it wasn't very amusing. Well, you're coming along whether it's amusing or not. No, I... Annie. Annie, something's gone wrong with me, and you're to blame for it. I? Yes, you. Until you came along and bought that lot, I was a peaceful, contented man who knew what he wanted and was out to get it the quickest way he knew how. But eating my dinner lately, I've begun to see your face on the plate. Well, tonight you've taken possession of the entire room and of me. Annie, I could throttle you with my bare hands. Something's really got to be done about you, Annie. Kiss me. No. No, I don't think the second time will be as surprising as the first No, but I mean it this time. Oh, you're lovely, Annie. You're beautiful, you're... Annie, kiss me. Oh, Stephen, I... Uh... Remember that first time? Yes. You said you wanted to give presents? Yes. I feel like that now. I'd like to send presents to everyone in Laraville. Uh, Laraville. Oh, I almost forgot. You're still one of Jim Cook's men. Yes, but Annie... I got a present from Laraville tonight, Stephen. And it isn't very nice. Here, read it. It ought to make you very proud. Go on, read it. Clark. Yes, he's dead. Your friend Jim Cork saw to that. Annie, I've got to leave. 
Must you? Yes, I'm going down to Laraville tonight. Well, I'm sorry you won't be here tomorrow, Mr. Lewis. My bill is coming up again. Annie, don't hurt yourself. Woman suffrage hasn't got a chance. Really? Now forget it, Annie, please. All right, all right. I guess you ought to know. You're such a smart man, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> We have tabulated the results on the woman's suffrage bill, and and we find that it has been passed unanimously. What? It's a frame oh, 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 oh. Why, hello, Steve. When did you get in? Anything happen up there? No, it happened here. Jim, I don't like being crossed. Crossed? What are you talking about? Just this. There wasn't going to be any rough stuff. We had that out once. And from my side, I meant it. And then I hear about Clark being shot. Oh, that? Yes, that. I was willing to go along if you played smart and let me call the moves. But when you lose your head and start plugging farmers in the back, I'm through. Now, look here. Now I'm all washed up. I resigned up at the legislature and I'm moving on. This came back to tell you. Now, wait a minute, Steve. Let me explain this thing for you. It's passed. Did you hear that, you mongrels? It's passed. Oh, get out of here. Hello, Mr. Tyler. Mr. Assemblyman, have you heard the news? It's passed. What's passed? Annie, put it over on you, my fine feathered friends. Women's suffrage is passed. You get that? The women have the vote. Why, they can't do that. Do you know anything about this, Steve? I know, so help me. Well, how did it happen? Well, that's what I'd like to know. Here's her telegram. Glad you have evidence against Mr. Clark because women's suffrage passed unanimously. Will arrive on tomorrow's train. Annie. Why, the little... I'll show her. I'm still running this town. And I'm going to run it my way. Now, wait, Jim. You're telling me you're through. You bet your sweet life you're through. And you'd better get out of here while you're still able. So you, they're going to try and get me, eh? All right, I'll show them. I'll run that school ma'am out of this town so fast, she thinks she was shot out of a 45. And all the rest of them that want votes for women. Fight, noisy, Sam, and Barney, come on. We've got work to do. How about it, Miss Morgan? Anything else for the press? Well, now, just a minute, please. Where was I? Well, your mother was just suffering from arterial sclerosis. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's really a dreadful disease. Yes, you know, ma'am, I... but could we skip just a few years? Uh, when did you become interested in politics? Oh, but I'm not interested in politics. I think they're silly. All this business about the Democrats hating the Republicans and vice versa is such nonsense. What I'm really interested in is putting Mr. Jim Cork in jail. <laughs> Conductor! Conductor! What's the matter there? It's a hold-up! It's a hold-up! All right, boys, keep them covered. Everybody sit down. Sit down, do you hear? Why, for mercy's sake, it's Barney Burkett. You put that gun away, Mr. Burkett, or I'll put you in jail, too. Well, if it ain't any. <laughs> going back to town with your votes for women, huh? Well, sister, that's one thing you ain't going to do. You're coming with me. I most certainly am not. Oh, yes, you are. The sheriff, I'm going to take care of you. They call it protective custody. Now, come on. Stop it, Mr. Burkett. Leave me alone. Come on. Leave me alone. Let him have it. Who is that? Who is that noise? Leave him alone. He's got ten men out there and they're coming out of the train. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. You have heard the evidence in the case of the people versus James Cork. The jury will now retire and consider its verdict. Oh, but Your Honor... The jury has already reached this verdict. Haven't we, ladies? How do you find the defendant? We find the defendant guilty as charged. Oh, you can't do this to me. A woman's jury ain't legal. It can't be, that's all. It, it can't be. Why, Annie? Oh, Stephen, where are you going? Oh, I thought I'd move along. It's about time. Oh, no, I... I, I want to speak to you, Stephen. About what? Well, uh, uh... This is a new hat. You like it? Yes. It's lovely, Annie. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, goodbye, Annie. Oh, no, Stephen, I... I know this is very terrible to say this, but... Well, I love you, Stephen, and I thought you loved me, and if you don't ask me to marry you, then I'll do something disgraceful. Why, Annie... <laughs> I couldn't marry a famous politician. Oh, but I'm not a famous politician. And I'm not going to be. I'll stay home and darn your socks and cook and, and take care of your children and, and help you run for governor. Annie. And... Oh, Stephen. You look so wonderful in a beard. Our stars, Loretta Young, Robert 
Preston and Edward Arnold will return for their curtain calls in just a minute. And Mr. DeMille will bring us news of next week's play. Not long ago, I read somewhere that on the average, Mrs. America spends four years of her life washing dishes. Four years. That's quite a big chunk of time. Why, in four years, you can go through college and get a degree. In your hands, well, in a lot less than four years of dishwashing with a harsh soap, they can get another kind of degree. D.H. Dishpan hands. Of course, it's the wrong kind of soap that gives you dishpan hands. Millions of women wash dishes for many years, yet their hands stay soft and lovely when they use the right kind of flakes. Flakes mild as the finest toilet soap. That's how gentle New Quick Lux is. You see, there's a difference in the way soaps affect your skin. Soaps containing harmful alkali dry the precious natural oils, and soon the skin grows parched and chapped, looks red and rough. You can be sure you're using soap that's kind to your hands when you stick to New Quick Lux. It has absolutely no harmful alkali. In hundreds of one-hand tests of five leading soaps, Lux was proved kindest to hands. These gentle flakes are thrifty, too, especially when you buy the economical big box. And fast, they leave glasses and dishes sparkling in no time. Begin using new quick Lux flakes for your dishes tomorrow. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Loretta Young, Robert Preston, and Edward Arnold have given us many a good time in the Lux Radio Theater. So right now, suppose you three come and take a bow. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. I've enjoyed coming back to do this play with Bob and Eddie. Now, that goes double for Bob and me. Well, uh, I'll make a confession. You're three of my favorite stars. Oh, that's so. Well, boss, how about giving me a day off from Reap the Wild Wind tomorrow? As I was saying, Loretta and Eddie, you're, uh, you're two of my favorite stars. <laughs> <laughs> you're a hard man, DeMille. <laughs> you can't tell me. This is my third picture for him. Simon Legree DeMille, we call him. <laughs> Behind his back. Oh, pardon me, boss. That's all right, Bob. That's all right. I, I discovered 30 years ago that nobody loves the director. By the way, Loretta... We're still waiting for the ballet dancer story you were going to make in pictures. Well, you won't have to wait much longer, Mr. DeMille. We've been in production now for six weeks. Well, what have you decided to call it, Loretta? We don't know yet. We're having a contest to decide that. Well, it's a lucky thing for us. We don't get mixed up in that ballet dancing, CB. Although, I'd like to see you try a few pirouettes. <laughs> so what have you got on the bill for next week, Bob? Uh, I'll tell you the name of the play first, Bob. It's Shop Around the Corner. But that's not the whole story. Because the stars are Claudette Colbert and Don Amici. The play is adapted from the Metro Goldwyn Mayer picture, a delightful comedy and one of the gayest love stories the screen has contributed in recent years. Personally, we think a team of stars like Don Amici and Claudette Colbert is a real scoop. So we'd like to meet you all at the shop around the corner next Monday night. Well, those who saw the picture won't want to miss it, Mr. DeMille. And anyone else has a great surprise coming. Good night. Good night, CB. Good night. Good night. We'll be on your trail again. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Claudette Colbert and Donna Michi in the shop around the corner. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Loretta Young will soon be seen in a Gregory Ratoff production to be released by Columbia Pictures. Edward Arnold appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor. His forthcoming picture is Paramount's Nothing But the Truth with Bob Hope. Robert Preston will soon be seen in the Paramount picture the night of January 16th. Our play was adapted from the picture The Lady from Cheyenne, based on the story The First Woman Voter, written by Jonathan Finn and Teresa Oakes. Included in tonight's play were Forrest Taylor as Hank Freeman, Jane Morgan as Mrs. McGinnis, Vivian Janice as Elsie, Lou Merrill as Billy, Ferdinand Munier as Ike Fairchild, Warren Ash as Barney, Buck Woods as George, Stanley Farrar as Dunbar, and Bruce Payne, Gail Gordon, Dix Davis, Gloria Blondell, Celeste Rush, Tyler McVeigh, Dick Ryan, and Barbara Jean Wong. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruiz. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>